Hi, this is Scott Garibay, and today we're going to talk about Andrew Yang and the Mark Marin problem that Andrew Yang possesses for the general election. All right, let's talk about it. All right, so who is Mark Marin? I'm going to define who he is for you. So one, I'm a big fan of, of Mark Marin. Uh, so Mark Marin is a stand-up comedian. He's old. He's like 50, maybe, you know, 50, 55 at least. Uh, and... Um, and, and he's been around, right? So he was a stand-up comedian back in the 80s, uh, and he's, open, he's openly discussed everything I'm about to say. Uh, he struggled with, with drugs in the 80s, you know, like almost like cliche comedian drugs, like coke and all that stuff, right? And so he was like right in the middle of it in the 80s, like coming up, doing stand-up, and then, then getting chosen from doing stand-up to, to be in a, have his own sitcom or be in a sitcom, but not being able to deal with all that pressure because he was struggling with, you know, uh, drugs. It was, you know, he had a hard time, right? He had a hard time in the 80s and 90s. Some of the problems were of his own making. Uh, many of the problems were of his own making. He's discussed all this openly. He resurrected his career in the two in the 2010s, early 2010s, maybe the late 20, uh, two, 2000s, um, and he he did something nobody else had ever done. It was uh, he created a podcast with over 300 uh, interviews with comedians, and it was just literally comedians would come to his garage and he would talk with them for an hour to two hours, and they would talk about comedy, right? And they were very genuine, very raw, uh, very honest. Right, and he created a museum of stand-up comedians between eighty, ninety, two thousands. Like virtually everybody is on there. I think the only, the few holdouts might be Seinfeld and Eddie Murphy, but he's had them all. Like all the big greats, like Gaffigan, and um, you know, uh, I don't know if he had Chappelle on there, but like you name. And, and here's the other thing: is like he had people who were from in movies and sitcoms all the way to people who never made it to that level and were just like uh, Bobby Lee, like uh, people who just stood in front of a, a brick wall with a mic, right? And he had just this amazing respect for comedy and he really resurrected his career with this podcast. He's now going on to do um, uh, Glow, which is a network show, a Netflix show, which is a network show about women in wrestling. It's a fiction show. And then he also had his own show on IFC. It was a little more low-key, but it was a television show. You know what I mean? He bounced from a podcast to an to a, a IFC television show and then went to a Netflix show. And they just put him in Joker. Okay? Now, Joker is a brand new Warner Brothers DC movie. It is called Joker because it is the story of Batman's greatest villain, Joker. Right? It, it stars Jocelyn Phoenix. And it is a big deal, right? Like this movie, people are talking, is this going to win an Oscar? They're going to say, is this going to help or hurt the DC franchise? You know, and the DC franchise, they own Batman, Superman, Flash, Wonder Woman. They own multi-billion dollar properties, right? Like intellectual properties, right? So this Joker movie, this is connected to billions of dollars of product, a multi-billion dollar co corporation. This is big time. Right, so Mark Marin recently was on Conan, Conan O'Brien. So this is uh, late August, maybe like a week or two ago. He goes, so Mark Marin goes on to Conan, and he is there specifically to talk about his projects, including Joker. Right, and so and so he is doing promotional material for Joker. Right, the Joker, the movie he's going to be in, and this movie has a lot riding on it. Right, this isn't just some scrub film. Right, Batman is one of the most successful. It is the, the Batman is the most successful comic book character in any comic book ever, bar none. Right, he's way above anything else. Right, well, way back in like the early two thousand, in the late two thousands, Nolan had one billion dollar movie with uh, with. The Batman, maybe more than one, but he had, you know, Nolan's the only person. DC, Warner Brothers, has not been able to create a billion dollar movie with a Batman in it for easily 10 years, right? And even when Nolan, Christopher Nolan, this uh, uh, literally a world class director, right? When he did it, it cost the life of Heath Ledger, right? Heath, Heath Ledger didn't die. 
because of him, him playing Joker, but it really makes you wonder if, like, that was really helpful for that, you know, like, somebody who was clearly struggling with life, and then they, they dive, you know, headfirst into this, you know, into a character that is literally the definition of insanity, you know, like, and so the idea of, you know, was Heath Ledger's death connected to this billion dollar success, did Heath Ledger pour his life into the Joker role, we, nobody knows the answer to it, but it's a valid question, right, so, like, Joker is a big deal, right? So Mark Maron rolls on to Conan O'Brien, and you know what? It blows my mind. You know what he does? He says, I don't like uh, comic book movies. I generally don't like him. I think they are for uh, grown nerd man-childs, right? He goes, they annoy me. It, you know, comic book movie, movies annoy me because it makes it so that when I want to go see a real film, a film that's not based on a comic book, I have to drive 10, 20 minutes, I maybe didn't use the word real, he's like, when I want to go see one of my movies, you know, something that's not a comic book movie, I have to drive 10, 20 minutes away to a smaller theater, right, so that I, you know, because all these grown, you know, nerd man-childs are, are taking seats in every other major theater, right, then he rejoiced, for never seeing the largest comic book ever, ever, ever was said. He didn't even see it and had no interest in it. Absolutely denigrated the people who go see, a whole, an entire subset of the people who see, a large subset of the people who see comic book movies, denigrated them, told them, you know, with his words, say, I don't respect you. I don't even think you're, I don't think you're an adult. Like, that is a deep cut. Like, that's coming out hard, right? Like, and this this wasn't a joke. He was being genuine with how he feels, right? And I was like, what the heck? You are promoting the film and the people that would go see your film, you're saying, I don't respect you. Why on earth would anyone do this? Now, this is important for Andrew Yang to understand why this happens. It is incredibly important for us as Andrew Yang supporters for Democrats to understand this and for anybody who's seeking to defeat Donald Trump in 2020, you have to understand what's happening with Mark Maron. Why would Mark Maron do this insane action? Why would he denigrate literally the people that need to go to see the movie he just labored to make, right? I'm gonna give you my opinion. Here's why, okay? Mark Maron genuinely dislikes comic book movies, comic books, and actually he does not, he said he does not dislike comic books, but he does not like comic book movies, right? Why on earth did he choose to be in one? That's a great question, right? He clearly doesn't like a major subset of people who go see comic book movies, right? Now, why wouldn't he just keep that information to himself? Here's why. His desire to insult is so strong his desire to seek comfort in insulting the people he doesn't care about is so strong that he will do it to his own destruction and to the destruction of people he has made business commitments to and with, right? This doesn't help him in any way. It massively hurts the film, right? And so why is he doing it? We have to understand this. Mark Marin is super intelligent. He's incredibly intelligent. It's arguable he's an ingenious. I have listened to 150 interviews with him talking to people who are crazy smart, right? This guy is, he is a world-class intellectual, right? He is incredibly intelligent, right? But his passion outweighs his intelligence when it comes for him to seek comfort in his ability and his desire to insult the people he does not care about. He takes comfort in that. It feeds his soul. This is not me saying this. He, he, oh, he openly talks about himself as being a bitter, angry, broken person. He says that all the time, right? And so his desire to insult the people that he, that he doesn't like is so strong, his desire for that comfort is so strong that he seeks it to his own destruction and even the destruction of his allies, right? Warner Brothers being his allies, the people who worked on this film being allies, the co-actors, the grips 
all these people. He's like, I don't care if any of you ever work again. I need my fix. I need to insult these people who like comic books, right? Now, what's this got to do with Andrew Yang? How does he process this clear, clear occurrence, right? And understand how to use this information to drive, to drive himself to a successful, to a successful defeat of Donald Trump. Well, here's the issue. The Dems are exactly the same. There is a large portion of Dems. You see it on, on Saturday Night Live, right? Saturday Night Live rails against um, Trump, has really built up the idea that Trump is an idiot, right? And this has been incredibly dangerous. Many, many Democrats and many Americans think that Trump is stupid. This has allowed him to get away with tons of stuff, tons of stuff. Donald Trump graduated from an Ivy League school. He is not stupid, right? But he gets to cloak himself in this, and, 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 and he gets to be unexpected when he shows up. When he shows intelligence, he's been cloaked in an idiocy that he, that he doesn't actually have. The media has portrayed him in a way that is not real, right? It's incredible. It is truly an incredible occurrence, right? So here's the thing, right? Basically, the Dems have this incredible desire to, uh, to villainize and insult and mock Trump and more, far more importantly, Trump's supporters, right? They, the, the Democrats, a large portion of Democrats, take comfort in the insult, in the denigration, in the villainizing of Trump supporters, right? And it's so comforting. It just, they soak it up. It, it just, it's a balm to them. They rub it on their, on their aches, right? They rub it on their annoyances and it comforts them, right? And they seek this comfort, right? This insulting, denigrating, um, villainizing comfort, right? To their own destruction. The only way Andrew Yang wins is if he can get Democrats to understand that the path to victory is not through rallying the base. We know this because Hillary did it and she lost. She literally won the popular vote. She rallied the base and Trump crushed her, crushed her, right? Dominated her, right? Made her look like a rank amateur when the reality is was that, that he was a political amateur and she was a decades long professional and he crushed her like a bug, like a boot under a heel, right? And the reason why I'm, I'm going hard on this point, right, is Democrats have to realize this. We Democrats, a, a portion of Democrats have to say, Okay, let's let's put on the hey, let's win cloak. Right? Let's let's set aside the insulting. Let's set aside the denigrating. Let's set aside the villainizing of Trump followers. And let's do this. Let's empathize with Trump followers. Let's be civil with Trump followers. And let's even have an opponent orientation. What is an opponent orientation? Asking your opponent why do you follow this guy? What do you need? What do you want? What can I do to help you to see that Andrew Yang's UBI is going to help you and help you to help others? Is it either going to help you directly or is it going to help you to help others? How, you know, and so, and here's the thing. I, I hear it. I know. I know there's Democrats out there, people listening to this right now, and you're like, you're out of your mind. I will never, I will never, right, empathize with a Trump follower, right? I, I'm not going to do it, Scott. I can't, I can't do that. I can't uh, be civil to them. I can't put myself into an opponent orientation where I'm listening more than I'm insulting and denigrating and villainizing. I won't do it, right? Well, you got a choice. You got a choice. You can give yourself the comfort, the enjoyment, the balm for your aches and your annoyances and go forward and insult them and denigrate them and villainize them exactly the way Mark Marin went to the people that would logically go see his movie and say, 
I denigrate you, right? I don't respect you. You are not an adult, right? I don't, I don't have any respect for you, right? He denigrated them. He insulted them. And he, he just rubbed that bomb of comfort over himself, right? It could cost... And the only question now is, is it going to cost a few million? Ten million? Hundreds of millions of dollars for him? How many people is it going to lose jobs for? Is it going to lose jobs for him? For the grips? For the, the makeup people? For the actors? Or for everyone connected to the project, right? So that's the question. The Democrats going forward, do you keep the comfort of denigrating and insulting Trump followers or do you empathize with them? Do you be civil to them? Do you even put yourself into opponent orientation and win them? And then just a few, you just need 5 to 15% of them and then win the presidency and the world. That's what's at stake. That is what Andrew Yang has to start communicating to his followers carefully, subtly, timed you know, little bits over time, getting getting Democrats to say, you know what, let's stop doing what we've done and let's win. That's what I'm talking about today. I think Andrew Yang can do it. He needs to put some thought into this. He needs to put some tactics around this, some strategy around this, and he needs to defeat the Mark Maron problem. All that's my opinion. I'd love to hear your opinion. Let me know in the comments below. Please consider liking and subscribing and have a wonderful millennium.